Thanks to all of you for coming this morning. Uh, we have approximately one hour before the 2020 presidential election begins, <laughs> so I think we ought to make the most of it. Uh, and I'd ask you to begin by turning your phones to stun so we're not interrupted. Uh, we'll ask Ambassador Christy Kenny to, uh, to speak. Uh, we'll chat a bit, and then we'll open it up to questions from and, and comments from all of you. Hopefully have a, have a, a good discussion. Uh, it's, an, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome uh, Christy Kenny, who is uh, not only uh, a great colleague and a mentor of mine, a coach, uh, a confidant, an advisor, a boss, uh, uh, a co-conspirator uh, in government, but most of all, uh, a dear friend uh, to join us today. The, uh, the country is really lucky to have had Ambassador Kenny uh, as a representative and as an advocate and as a policymaker. Uh, and frankly, I feel that a country that would nurture a senior uh, government leader like Christy Kenny is, is, uh, is a country that I'm proud to, to, the, to live in. Um, Christy Kenny reached the rank of uh, career ambassador, which is the highest civilian rank uh, possible to attain in the Department of State. It's the equivalent of the military's four stars for a general or for an admiral. Uh, she held any number of really important uh, positions, working for secretaries of state Madeleine Albright and uh, all the way through uh, John Kerry, uh, everyone in between, and in the uh, uh, after a series of important ambassadorships in uh, Ecuador, in the Philippines, in Thailand, uh, and after briefly uh, working to shape the social media and the outreach strategy for the East Asia Bureau in the State Department, uh, Secretary Kerry asked Christie to become the counselor of the State Department, which is really the Secretary's right hand and the senior most advisor uh, for foreign policy. And so that's indicative of uh, the trust uh, that he, that the National Security Advisor, that the President, like uh, Secretaries, National Security Advisors, and Presidents before him, uh, uh, the esteem in which uh, they held Christie. So we're here the morning after. Uh, looking across the Pacific uh, at Asia and asking ourselves, what now, what does it all mean? Uh, so let me hand the microphone over to you, Christy. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here in New York, and you always want to have one of your best friends introduce you, obviously. Don't usually get that many good adjectives in one speech, so thank you. I'm going to talk about two things very briefly, and then I think we all want to hear your thoughts, ideas. First, I'm going to talk about... Can you still hear me? Yes. What is next in U.S.-Asia relations? And that's because this is actually a very significant month, midterms aside. And then I'm going to talk about the midterm elections yesterday and what might or might not be important for us as those who care deeply about Asia and about Asia's relationships with the United States. But let me start with what's next. And that's just the calendar this month, which is, is actually quite significant for all of us. First, this week, there will not be talks in New York tomorrow between Secretary Pompeo and his North Korean counterparts. Those have been, to use a diplomatic phrase, postponed until a future date. So I'll get back to North Korea in a little bit, but that is not happening. However, Friday in Washington, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense are meeting with their counterparts from China to look at uh, what's called a diplomatic and security dialogue. But it's an important session for people at that level to get together and talk about the U.S.-China relationship and where we're going, irritants, problems, opportunities. So mark that on your calendar and try to look at what comes out of that in any way. Next up, we have this weekend. And it's not technically an Asia event, but I want you all to watch it. This is this, the celebration, the commemoration of the end of World War I in France. Brings together a lot of leaders, none of whom are Asian, 
But I very much suspect President Trump, who is attending, will hear a great deal both about the Iran situation, the sanctions, what's next, but also something about North Korea and what we're doing there, what they'll be expected to do. And if I were on the president's staff, which I'm not, I'd certainly slip him a few talking points about the importance of sanctions on North Korea. And I think he will also hear from them about trade, which also can have some spillover impacts. And remember, you know, this is a, a grouping that also includes Putin of Russia. So it's a significant grouping. You move from that a few days later to the big Asia summits for the year, the East Asia summit and the ASEAN, U.S. ASEAN meetings in Singapore, followed by the APEC summit in Papua New Guinea. President Trump is not attending. I wish he were, because again, as an Asianist, it's great to have our president engaging. This isn't the first time the U.S. president hasn't been able to go. And I'll kind of run through with you why. First of all, it's a long way to go. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot of travel to the other side of the earth. And as you will see when I finish discussing this month, our president will already be out of the country for a number of events. So if you're planning schedules, you know, you're balancing domestic issues, what's going on here, vis-a-vis -vis the need to travel overseas. Second of all, I think all leaders feel this way. While the opportunities these summits to get together with fellow leaders and talk is tremendous, there is a fair amount of speechifying. And, and I think in my experience, Danny, I think you'd share this, presidents do tend to find these large gatherings, a lot of speeches for a few meetings. So it gets harder to convince them to fly how many hours, even on Air Force One, out to Papua New Guinea, where, by the way, the other problem is, and it's always a problem getting presidents to Asia, you're on a 12-hour time difference clock. So if there is anything that happens back home, a domestic incident, a natural disaster, you're 12 hours off. You're either waking the president at 3 in the morning. It's hard to convince the people the president is following this closely. Really? I thought he'd be sleeping in Singapore, Papua New Guinea. So the president is sending Vice President Pence instead. That's, that's a good substitute. And the vice president also represented him earlier this year at the um, Organization of American States Summit. So there's some precedent for that. The bad news from my perspective is that President Trump is a very much of a, a personal relationship president. You know, does values his relations with fellow leaders and does well with them. And of course, these summits are a great opportunity for him to not only hold bilateral meetings, but to get to know a little bit on the margins of dinners and meetings, some of his counterparts, and particularly from some countries where he may not have the opportunity in the course of his presidency to visit, but would be good to get to know them a little bit. So it's, it's an opportunity missed. We move next from that to the 30th of November in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where the G20 is meeting. And remember, that session will bring the president of China, it will bring President Putin, it will bring the president of Mexico, of Chile, the um, prime minister of Singapore as the chair of ASEAN will be there, Prime Minister Modi of India, uh, Abe of Japan. So that's a pretty significant Indonesia that, I think, and the president is going to that. He's already announced he's going to meet with President Xi there. I believe there's a, a meeting with Prime Minister Abe in the works. So that, to me, is looking like a particularly significant summit. Just for the opportunities to meet with Asian leaders, particularly the Xi meeting in light of the U.S.-China, what I'll call difficulties for the moment, the trade issues, Vice President Pence's speech laid out security concerns, some sanctions on technology transfers. So I think that's a, a very, very significant date on the calendar and some pretty interesting meetings. The White House has not that I've seen said so, but there also looks to be a meeting with Putin there, which could be interesting as well. So I would definitely put that on the calendar. That's going to lead me into the midterms, but as a preview of my coming attractions, I would say don't count out a deal with President Trump and President Xi. I would, I would not rule out that, that they will come to some kind of agreement on trade issues. And that's because 
the midterms were held yesterday. I'd argue that the results, I'm from Washington, I spent my life in Washington, I'm a Washingtonian. I'd argue everybody wins. If I were a Republican or a Democrat, you'd both say, winner. Right? The Democrats took back the House, narrow majority, a few races still to be decided, but they can claim victory. The president, I think, can also claim that his campaigning, his work, created a victory for him. The Republicans held on to the Senate, may have even gained a few seats. Some governorships seem up and down, but I think both sides claim victory. Um, that's both good and bad. It, it means we continue to have a rather polarized Washington. I think that we will see the House of Representatives going forward will be very domestically focused. A lot of uh, inquiries, subpoenas, investigations, they will act as a check on presidential policies they don't like. But my gut instinct, and I could be wrong, of course, is that we won't see a lot of new policy initiatives coming out, that the next two years will really be about the Democrats trying in the House to constrain the president, the Republicans trying in the Senate to promote the president's policies. <coughs> I do think, however, the president, as Danny pointed out, the 2020 race is already on. I, I think the president, inspired by his campaign barnstorming, will be eager for some big wins. The election is over. He'd like to keep the center stage, sail into January when a new Congress comes in, feeling very strong. For that reason, for Asia, I look at two things. One, North Korea. I think the president is, is still optimistic, upbeat, after his Singapore meetings back when with the North Koreans. And I think he's going to want to see some real progress. So despite today's meetings being canceled and the Secretary of State and our North Korea representative working, I think, quite diligently behind the scenes, I bet you'll see a strong presidential push for a second summit. And, and if I were you know, putting money on it, which I wouldn't, um, I'd say maybe pretty early in the year. The president's going to want to start off strong, you know, hear those echoes of Nobel Peace Prize echoing, and he will go back to saying, look, since he started these talks, there haven't been missile tests. The world is therefore safer, and therefore, how can we move forward? I think he will have strong support from South Korea, where they obviously are very eager to see that move forward. And it'll be interesting to see what he hears from other allies at these coming November meetings, interested in where he's going with North Korea, what he does. But I'd watch that. And the second space I'd watch is China. You'll remember the president started off by welcoming President Xi to Mar-a-Lago, a very warm, personal friendship. Again, it goes back to President Trump's real reliance on that personal relationship he builds and develops. And so I think this upcoming meeting at the end of the month, the midterms are over. He will have heard from farmers, soybean farmers and the like, who, who are very concerned about trade issues. And so I think the president will want to come out of that saying he's, he's cut a deal. He has solved problems. He has, is moving forward on this. I could be wrong, but I, I think he's very much going to want to come out of that meeting announcing a gain, a win, something moving forward. So I would watch those two spaces in the next several months. A couple other things to watch after the midterms, cabinet reshuffle. We've heard a lot of rumors about this going forward. And by the way, it's, as you remember, quite traditional after two years in office. You see a lot of people who either want to go home. Washington wasn't as much fun as they hoped. Their families would like to return. They're tired. They're exhausted. Or the president, who's now had two years of governing, wants a different look. Lots of rumors. I think the attorney general is, is a, a very likely guy to exit. We've heard a lot of rumors about the secretary of defense, which I think for those of us who are Asia fans would be too bad. He's traveled extensively, I think been an extraordinary partner in recognizing the importance of Asia. But there are others. Secretary of Homeland Security might go. We will obviously have a new US-UN ambassador. Sec ambassador Haley is leaving at the end of the year. So. There are 
some significant changes coming up, and I don't know how that will affect U.S.-Asia relations or others, but it's, I think, very, very worth watching. And finally, a homework assignment for all of us. A new Congress brings to, to bear in Washington new faces, new senators, new members of Congress, new staff. I've talked to a number of, of people who've been in the U.S. government and either as a congressman or a senator for years. They all say the first six months on the job is when they decide what issues they're going to be interested in beyond what their constituents may have sent them to do. And as I look across these elections, with the exception of the immigration issue, no one got elected on foreign policy issues. So the focus is going to be very domestic, particularly leading into a 2020 election. So we need, and by we I mean every single one of us, to start getting to know, starting in January or before, if any of you have great contacts, new members of Congress, new senators and their staffs, and talking to them about why does Asia matter to the United States? Why should they care? Why should they start watching these issues, playing an active role, being energized? And for those of you who want a couple quick talking points, we have five treaty allies in Asia. Half the world's population lives in Asia. It's an immense market for U.S. goods and services, and that should be of interest to every single member of the U.S. Congress. It is a great source of tourism. There were three million Chinese who visited the United States in 2016 alone. It is a source of students who come here and help bolster our universities, our research capacities. It is a culturally significant region for the United States. I suspect every member elected has people in their district who are Asian Americans. I guarantee you every town in the United States has an Asian-themed restaurant. Asia, seriously, Asian-themed restaurants are what the Italian restaurants were 50 years ago. You'll find a, a, a Thai restaurant everywhere. What was the blockbuster movie of the summer? Crazy Rich Asians. So I, 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 and again, these are things that may not naturally occur to newly elected members of Congress who are busy getting their office allocated remembering why their constituents sent them. But this is a huge moment to remember the economic, the security, and the cultural relationships that matter deeply. And so I hope you all will use your friends, your contacts, and make sure we get out there so that we have as many members of Congress as possible interested, engaged, caring deeply, willing to travel, and willing to work. And with that, there's so much more we could say, but I'm very good to hear from all of you. So Danny, I'll turn the mic back over. Thank you, Christy. Um, for those of you who are meeting Ambassador Kennedy for the first time, this was classic Christy. Uh, concise, substantive, thought-provoking, to the point, erudite, and it ended in an assignment. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> um, thank you, Christy. I, um, I'd, I'd like to build out a little bit uh, your point about uh, what the implications of the midterms may be for Asia, uh, for Asians, as well as for uh, Asia policy. You made uh, two sets of important points about both North Korea and, and the U.S.-China relationship, the U.S.-China trade uh, dispute. Um, Steve Bannon made no secret uh, in the months uh, or frankly, as long ago as practically a year before the midterms in saying that his advice to the president was, you want to go into the midterms at war with China and at peace with North Korea. Uh, and that seemed to be a pretty good strategy. And now that we're beyond the midterm, uh, there is a real question about how uh, the president and the administration, and including a new cabinet, I don't think you mentioned the speculation that uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, might also be in the ranks of uh, those who decide to spend more time with their families. Uh, how a new administration and a new cabinet and a president on the far side of the midterm is going to approach this. I think on North Korea, I certainly share your view that uh, the president would like to keep the relative uh, peace and quiet going, although that has its own risks, particularly in terms of 
proliferation. We could wind up with a North Korea that's de facto a nuclear state like Pakistan. Uh, and with China, there's no question that uh, the Chinese are signaling that they would like a deal. The question and the problem has always been that the sort of deal that the Chinese have put on the table uh, doesn't configure with the demands of the administration, which uh, depending on which particular speech or cabinet secretary you're listening to, go far beyond the trade and the economic agenda that the president seems most focused on and covers uh, everything from security to cyber to law enforcement to human rights, et cetera. So there's a big challenge uh, ahead in that. A few things that I, I would flag in no particular order are include the fact that 100 women were elected mm -hmm to the House of Representatives in this, uh, in this election alone. And I think that uh, for people like you and me who spent our career overseas saying, hey, look at, look at this, United States, this is a positive development, um, it's something too important to pass by. It also brings back the, uh, the fact that when we served together in the Obama administration, in the State Department alone, uh, not only were you the counselor of the department, but I think at least three of our undersecretaries uh, were women. And uh, certainly among the six regional assistant secretaries, infamously, uh, I was the only man. Uh, there were five women assistant secretaries, which uh, simply proves the old saying, for a woman to get ahead in a man's world, she has to be twice as good as a man. But fortunately, that's not difficult. Um, I think that uh, uh, we can acknowledge the departure of some pretty large figures uh, and mainstream uh, conservative figures from the Senate, people like John McCain, uh, who's passed away, people like uh, Corker and, and Flake and Hatch, who, who have retired. I think that there is an, the dog that didn't mark, which was there was no uh, identifiable cyber disruption or foreign interference mm -hmm. that uh, challenged American diplomacy. And even the fact that the electorate is shown as so divided uh, uh, and as some pundit put it, uh, we've now built a wall not on the Mexican border, but uh, in our own borders, separating right and left and uh, black and white and so on. The fact is that this was kind of a something in it for everyone mm -hmm. election, and there's a certain amount of balance, and I think it's plausible, and, and I even hope that uh, Asian friends will take from that a, a recognition that the checks and balances that are built into the American system, uh, the gyroscope that keeps us from tipping over uh, entirely, uh, is is still functioning. As a practical matter, the the chairmanships of the committees in the House will flip to the Democratic side. I think Elliot Engel, somebody that we've worked closely with on foreign policy, uh, is said to be the likely a uh, new chair of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee in the House. Uh, and that cr opens the door to uh, the Democrats in the House uh, generating draft legislation. Uh, and it is an open question whether that legislation will ever see the light of day. But it does give them uh, the opportunity to try to put something forward that is constructive, uh, that has policy uh, objectives to it, and that conceivably could win bipartisan support. So that's another example mm -hmm. where um, all may not be lost. But can you, uh, Christy, add uh, or subtract to <laughs> the list of things that you might want to flag for Asian audiences? I actually thought another feature of our elections yesterday was <coughs> the number of complaints about polling lines and polling places. And I'm not as young as some of you in the room, and I think this is the first time I've really seriously heard this in a number of years. And it means we had a great turnout, but it also means I think in a number of places we were 
election officials were ill prepared for that. And I think that's an interesting lesson that that American election officials will need to take away is how do we guarantee in 2020 that access to the polls is is easier, quicker. All of today's technology works better to get people in and out. How many of you voted yesterday that are eligible to vote? If you're not an American citizen, please don't raise your hands. Um, How many of you had difficulty at the polls, long lines? It's not a terrible sample. I voted early, so I had no trouble. I had an army of volunteers sort of sweeping me through. I felt very special. But... But it does say to me that we need to be looking. And for overseas audiences, this will, I think, be a look at American elections and and how do we in the future guarantee that people can get in quickly, that polling lines are not so prohibitive as to discourage voters. I do think on the positive side, you know, that the passion, the energy and the spirit to get out and vote in the midterm was impressive. And it'll be interesting. And I hope we can keep that energy regardless of how people vote for the 2020 elections. But Danny, if you're ready, I think we should hear from the experts around the room. Absolutely. So um, I'll open the floor now to questions and comments. I would just ask that you uh, begin by identifying yourself and that you uh, be concise. So let's, uh, sorry, gentleman in the blue jacket. Uh, I'm Charlie Kimball with the (coughs) Korea Center for International Finance. With the budget cuts in the State Department, and perhaps there was going to be anyway, there's been huge turnover in the State Department, particularly of people with your kind of experience. So I'm wondering, how is the next generation different from our generation, as it were, in terms of people in the State Department? Um, Yeah. Danny, chime in. But... uh the good news is, and I suspect you'll find this in many places around the world, the next generation of the State Department is, is talented and a lot smarter than I ever was. I'm sort of amazed when I see these really bright, talented young people. I also find that they are passionate about um, international affairs. And, and, you know, this is a generation that's grown up with a lot of expeditionary diplomacy, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, places that are can be difficult to serve. And so I think they're, they're very, very eager and willing Let me address the first part of your question, though, because I do think that this administration has been slow to fill key vacancies at the State Department. And I'm hopeful that maybe with the midterms over and the all-consuming focus on elections, we might get down to getting some people confirmed. An assistant secretary for Asia, there has still been no successor confirmed to fill Danny's shoes, and Danny's been gone and up here now for a year and a half you know, we, we need someone in that position to manage our day-to-day relations with the countries of Asia. There are ambassadorships still vacant. Australia is a big one, for example. So I, I think, and, and I'm, again, I'm a relentless optimist. I would have never been a diplomat if I weren't. But I'm hopeful that we might get some movement on some of that. And there's some other big jobs at state still vacant. And we need that. The, the junior rising staff are talented, but they don't yet have the leadership skills to do that. I'd add uh, that it's tr- the pool of uh, young people out there from whom, uh, from among whom the State Department and the foreign affairs agencies uh, draw is vastly more internationalized and more globally competent than any previous generation. That's the good news. The bad news is that at least temporarily, uh, the attractiveness and the luster of public service is somewhat depressed, uh, somewhat diminished. Uh, in terms of funding, look, there's a perpetual struggle for resources within the U.S. government. The administration at the outset sought uh, under Rex Tillerson and, and the White House to make really draconian, uh, damaging cuts to the foreign affairs uh, budget and the operational budget, and it was Congress uh, that intervened and restored uh, the lion's share of the funding. Uh, so with the uh, ballooning of the deficit, the federal deficit, I think it's going to get tougher and tougher for the State Department to win uh, resources. But on the other hand, that always serves as an incentive to be creative and to modernize. We're in the, you know, the digital economy, the fourth, gener- the fourth in- revolution, and there may be a lot of innovative solutions to 
uh, goals that in the past had been, uh, you know, heavy consumers of, of the budget. So, uh, let's see. Oh, man. Yes, please. Oh, yes, my name is Kevin Shanley of the Policy Institute. And back, I'm going to say seven or eight months ago, there was quite a tension on the Sino-Russian military maneuvers. And um, I don't think many people realize the significance and how large those maneuvers were. One-third of the Russian ground forces and, of course, not an insignificant number of Chinese participants. May I just add one point? The retiring general of NATO recently is quoted as saying, as he sees the world, the future war will be China and Russia against the United States, which I think would not please Mr. Kissinger. So would you like to comment on that triangle relationship between um, Washington, Moscow, and Beijing, and where is it heading, if you... Uh, one uh, military exercise does not an alliance make, but uh, the exercise this spring was very significant. It was uh, unprecedented in scale, and it was distinguished by uh, the Chinese Defense Minister Wei in, uh, in Moscow announcing that uh, this exercise is a signal to the United States that China and Russia are uh, cooperating. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, the administration may have uh, facilitated this inadvertently in uh, lumping China and uh, Russia together uh, repeatedly in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the nuclear posture review, and uh, citing them as a pair of uh, principal strategic threats to the United States. Um, I'm not a big believer in the utility of, of name-calling uh, in foreign affairs. And I think there's a risk that if you define uh, a competitor as an enemy, then you're going to wind up with an enemy, or in this case, two enemies. All that said, the uh, barriers to genuine cooperation on military and strategic issues between Russia and China are pretty high. Uh, they, frankly, have a little more to fear from each other than uh, they have to fear from the United States, in my opinion. That said, as you point out, uh, in the Kissinger sense, uh, you never want to be in a position where uh, two rivals have a better relationship with each other than you have with, uh, with either one of them. Some of that is beyond the control of the administration. Uh, because of the way that Putin uh, is operating, uh, there's no realistic prospect for uh, an, a, a near-term improvement, I don't think, in U.S.-Russian relations. But we certainly don't want to be driving uh, the Chinese and the Russians into one another's arms. But it goes back to a bigger point. I, I would um, differ slightly with Christie's uh, positive uh, or glass half full characterization of the decision of the president not to go to uh, Asia for the East Asia Summit, A ASEAN, and so on. Positive. Okay, I you know I I'm very familiar with the headwinds uh, <laughs> that make it hard for a president to do that. But um, <coughs> what the what the administration has put forward as the alternative to this Russian China condominium is a heavy investment in a regional order that's based on rules, the free and open Indo-Pacific. And I know, uh, we both know from experience that it, it takes a lot uh, to persuade our counter foreign counterparts that uh, our words are, not, are in reflective of a real commitment, that we're putting our resources behind our nominal policy. And the most precious resource in the world is the time of the President of the United States. So while it's true that, in, that the Fort Hood massacre on the eve of the Asia summit uh, prevented uh, President Obama from going one year, and the 2012 election prevented him from going a second time, but apart from that, 
he he always made the trip, and we uh, we litigated this each year in the in the NSC um, because it is hugely expensive in terms of the president's time and tough. But look, the president made it to Singapore. The president went uh, last year. Um, I think it's unf I th I th I'm disappointed, and I think that many Asians are disappointed that uh, the president, precisely because, as Christy pointed out, uh, because he has such a personalized uh, style of diplomacy, uh, wasn't able to show up. And I think that creates space for certainly Xi Jinping, uh, as we've seen in 2017 at Davos, at APEC, uh, and we're going to see again, to sort of claim the stage uh, and to uh, purport to be the champion of uh, global institutions when, in fact, uh, the United States really has been the, the author and the architect of those institutions. Yes, question over here. Bill Rayford. <clears throat> what does the United States have to fear or to welcome from a greater rapprochement between North Korea and South Korea? I'll start by saying um, a little of both. Partly, um, I think the key in, in building some kind of future with North Korea for both the South Koreans, the Americans, and I'd add in the Japanese and the Chinese to that equation, is that it be done in some sort of tandem possibility. So the fear from a, an American perspective would be that the South Koreans might go too fast and agree to things that would involve, for example, our troops, our, our economic postures that we wouldn't be prepared to give at this stage without perhaps getting significant concessions on reductions of, of weapons, testing, terrorism, that sort of thing from North Korea. I mean, I think that could be the fear that as you move this carefully calibrated matrix, you could get out of step and that could be awkward. It could be potentially dangerous. And you could have a situation, which I don't think will develop, but you could have a situation where South Korea and North Korea come to some kind of agreement, and then suddenly there's an expectation that we would fall into line with that, that we would be willing to put scarce budget dollars into helping North Korea economically, you know, without having laid any groundwork or gotten enough concessions to, to make that possible. So I think that that is the fear. The positive side is if, if it's managed well, maybe this all moves in some kind of setting together where we all work largely in tandem, admitting each country has perhaps slightly different interests, but not overall. The goal is for some kind of peace and stability on the, on the Korean Peninsula. You know, the, the, the possibility if, if, if the orchestra all plays their parts at the right moment this could move forward pretty well. Danny, I'm sure you'll have thoughts. Uh, you, you said it very, uh, very eloquently. The, I'd simply reinforce the point that uh, really all comes down to the uh, synchronization of U.S. policy and South Korean policy. North Korea has always flourished by playing uh, the powers off against each other. It benefits from creating schisms and working the uh, the uh, various differences in perspective between Washington and South Korea. Uh, and there are some differences, even though we're closely aligned in terms of broad objectives. Uh, the uh, immediate priorities of, uh, of reconciliation, of family visits, of uh, potential for infrastructure and trade between North and South look a lot different uh, from Seoul and from Washington, as does the global nonproliferation agenda. So uh, keeping these things in sync uh, is always a challenge. Uh, it's a lot easier when the North Koreans are misbehaving. Uh, that, that tends to promote uh, solidarity between Washington and Seoul. When the North Koreans are uh, seemingly opening the door, uh, then those, uh, those differences in priorities and perspectives to can, can create tensions. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, rapprochement, reconciliation, 
uh, and confidence building measures between uh, south and north are good for the peninsula, good for the region, good for the world, and good for the United States. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Kenny, you've just mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that you don't count a deal between uh, President Xi, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Trump uh, in the upcoming G20 summit. And is it because of uh, because that the midterm elections would possibly produce a divided U.S. Congress that made uh, would make Trump continue putting pressure on China so as to secure his domestic support? What's your take on that? And Mr. Russell, I would also like to hear your perspectives about the um, future developments of U.S.-China trade frictions. Thank you. I, you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Uh, I'm a Xinhua reporter from, I'm a reporter from Xinhua News Agency, North America. Thanks. Thank nice to have you here. Don't be nervous at all. This is a group of friends. <laughs> Correct? Yes. Huh? You know, it's always hard to know when two leaders will decide to make a deal or not. I, I think with the elections over, President Trump will feel a little freer to, to make some kind of trade deal with President Xi. It, you know, it, these are never easy to do, but I think they might be able to find at least some common ground to reduce the frictions. And I think when two leaders meet, inevitably they want to emerge from the meeting declaring they got something done. Two leaders never want to emerge from a meeting saying, well, that was just a meeting, nothing happened. This is a fact of life. Those of us who have staffed leaders know this. So I think there will be people on both the Chinese and the American side who will be looking for some progress in the relationship. You know, will it be a big deal? Maybe not, but in terms of trade. But would there be some kind of lessening, some kind of agreement somewhere? I think that's very possible and, in fact, quite likely. I don't know what it would look like, but I think it is very possible that the two of them sitting face to face in the room are going to want to emerge from that meeting with something positive to say that they have been able to agree together. And I think with the elections over, President Trump will feel he's got enough of a mandate to make some positive movements. But, you know, only the, the two leaders know that for sure. I think it's very hard to say whether uh, President Trump believes that the time has come on November 29th or 30th uh, when they meet at the G20 uh, to make a deal. The sort of art of the deal uh, from in, the, in uh, Trump terms uh, seems to be to maximize pressure on your negotiating partner to raise all kinds of issues, to raise all kinds of risks. Uh, and then when you feel that you've really got him on the ropes uh, when your opponent is uh, at, its, at their weakest, uh, they will come to you with the, with the biggest deal, offering you more than you could have gotten at the table, and then you grab it and everything is forgiven. That seems to be a general pattern. It's uh, an open question whether that's going to work in a system like the Chinese system or with a leader like Xi Jinping. Uh, that said, uh, the president's also also demonstrated an ability to unexpectedly uh, make a deal that, uh, when you look at it, really doesn't have much in it. Uh, the deal he made with the EU uh, had Junkers on trade with Europe really was nothing more than just a kind of truce. <clears throat> Uh, and that's true. Uh, that's true in some of the other uh, deals that uh, he's announced. Uh, he's got a remarkable ability to sell uh, what he's decided on. So we shouldn't count out the possibility that uh, he could do this. That said, the administration has, most recently in the speech that Vice President Pence gave at the Hoover Institute. Uh, raised so many issues and created such an extensive a list of uh, offenses by China that, frankly, are largely shared, uh, not only by the business community or the policy community, but by Congress. That it seems to me it may be hard for the administration to simply set those issues aside and say, okay, 
well, we've reached a deal on, uh, on the trade figures, uh, but we haven't dealt with uh, forced transfer of technology, of cyber theft, of intellectual property, of the industrial policy <coughs> made in China 2025, 5G, um, law, uh, range of law enforcement issues, South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, the debt trap diplomacy, of BRI, all the, the many things that are of concern. And they're of concern on both sides of the political aisle in Congress. So one could imagine with a uh, Democratic House, uh, the I International Relations Committee uh, and individual members of Congress, uh, both Republican and Democrats, asking in the aftermath of a, of a happy announcement in uh, Buenos Aires, well, that may be well and good, but what about the rest of the agenda? What, you know, what did you do? And that, I think, uh, may push back against the prospect for uh, an early deal. More questions? Hi, Edward Tillinghouse from Shepard Mullen. Um, there was, in your opening remarks, you mentioned a fair amount about a potential domestic focus in, in Congress. And I'd like to, I was curious about your thoughts on the interrelationship between the domestic economy, which, you know, depending on which, which day you read the paper, it's, it's doing well or it's not doing well. But to the extent it is uncertain, how the interplay with the prospects for a trade deal and how that drives it, does, does a fault, defaulting or, or a poorer U.S. economy drive a trade deal where President Trump's core focus or core support tends to be more a U.S.-centric populace? Tough question to answer. I mean, it really depends, I think, also on some strategic looks at how <coughs> constituents, how people voted, why they voted, what's on their mind. You know, is the economy doing well? Is it not? I, I, most statistics are it is doing well. I don't know whether that means the president feels pretty confident he could agree to. And by the way, when I'm talking about a trade deal announced out of China, I think Danny made a good point. I, I don't think I'm talking about an over-encompassing package, a, a, a grand, deeply negotiated strategy. I think I'm talking about solving some small pieces and if I were imagining forward, you might set up a working group to negotiate, to work, you know, the coming out of it. I don't think two leaders in an hour or two together can go through the laundry list of tariffs and, and solve each one. But maybe you could come off with, with some agreement. As Danny says, it could be a truce. It could be something and, and then an agreement to work on other issues. But I, some of this will depend very much, I think, on, on, again, the president himself, how he feels coming out of these elections, how he feels after this other series of meetings. What does he hear from his meetings in Europe? What does the vice president bring back from his meetings in Asia? And therefore, as he heads to Buenos Aires, where is, where is his thinking process? And I, that, that's a hard one for me to predict. I, I think you laid out very clearly the different ways it could go, and I, I think we'll have to wake up after the Buenos Aires meeting and find out. I think the high-end scenario for the uh, U.S.-China summit at the, uh, the G20 would be for President Trump to announce that he is suspending, for perhaps a fixed period of time, uh, the announced imposition of 25% tariffs on the $230 billion uh, that are uh, coming into force uh, at 10%, uh, pending a better offer from the Chinese to be negotiated by Bob Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, et cetera, et cetera. That's somewhere between the EU truce mm -hmm. and a kind of uh, Trump-style sort of Damocles, like we're setting the clock on you to... To, to reach a, a satisfactory outcome. I think that would be the high-end scenario. If the president were to go forward with, uh, on January 1st, with the 200-plus billion dollar uh, tariffs, bumping them up to 25%, there will be a qualitative and a fundamental uh, difference from the tariffs imposed thus far uh, 
uh, which have largely hit large manufacturers and farmers, have been mitigated by, to some extent by the depreciation of, or the appreciation of the yuan. Um, this will really hit consumers in a matter of months. And it will hit consumers perhaps at a time when uh, the farmers who have stuck it out, even though they've been badly hurt uh, financially by the tariffs, uh, they still generally seem, according to the polls, to harbor faith that uh, this will pay off in the long term. Uh, but that confidence will inevitably er erode. So it's easy for me to imagine that four, six, eight months after the imposition of uh, major uh, new tariffs on China, that the economic and the political situation in the United States would make it untenable for the president not to make a deal. Um, moreover, I know that uh, there's thinking among at least some of the people that I talk to in the White House uh, that the Chinese shouldn't uh, be allowed to misconstrue the uh, loss of the House as a sign of weakness on the part of uh, President Trump, and that it will take some time for the Chinese government to conclude that notwithstanding a setback in the midterms, uh, their position and leverage is not enhanced and President Trump's position is not weakened, so they may as well go ahead and, you know, give him everything he wants. They're, whether that's a boast or a genuine <laughs> strategy, I don't know, um, but it's certainly the way that uh, people are talking now. We're, yeah, we're running low on time, so we have time for one more question uh, in the back. If you can wait for the microphone and introduce yourself, please. I don't think your microphone is on. Come up to the table. Thanks. Hi, Daniel Moss, Bloomberg Opinion. Danny, great to hear you talking about the level of Iran. It's not often I hear you do that. Uh, can you give us your perspective on Prime Minister Abe's trip to Beijing uh, last month, where that relationship is going economically as well as politically? Thanks. Well, funny you should ask because I'm just back from uh, Tokyo where the, I'm proud to say, the Asia Center, op the Asia Society opened uh, a center in Tokyo uh, for the first time. And that's a, a major uh, landmark, and uh, a lot of credit goes to Tom Nagorski for that. Um, you know, it's been uh, eight years uh, since the Japanese president was able to travel to China. Uh, some of this is cyclical. It's, it's not unusual for uh, there to be a downturn in Sino-Japanese relations when a new uh, general secretary takes office, and it's typically in the second term of that uh, general secretary president uh, where, for various reasons, uh, things begin to warm up uh, between Beijing and Tokyo. Um, there are a lot more very specific and particular issues uh, that have impeded uh, that relationship. But I think, number one, uh, the uncertainties in the global economy have created incentives for both China and uh, Japan uh, to try to stabilize uh, their overall relationship, uh, the political as well as the economic. Uh, there's always been a, genu a generally warm uh, trade relationship and investment relationship between the two. And there's often been a pretty chilly uh, political uh, relationship. Uh, that got particularly bad after a 2012 incident in uh, the Senkakus in the East China Sea. Uh, and the, uh, both the Chinese and the uh, Japanese governments have been looking uh, for ways to mend fences uh, for some time. I think it might be that the Chinese uh, government decided to wait until they saw the results of the internal ruling party election 
this summer in Japan. And since uh, uh, Abe was re-elected as president of the ruling party and therefore guaranteed another three years as Japan's prime minister, since this is the 40th anniversary of uh, Sino-Japanese relations and friendship, and since Japan will be hosting the G20 next year, and therefore the Chinese president, in effect, has no choice but to go to Japan, this seemed like a propitious time for them to take the fence mending to uh, the next level. Now, I, I do think that the uh, take the Japanese senior officials uh, with whom I met at their word when they say that there's absolutely no diminution in the strength of Japan's alliance, relationship, friendship, and commitment to the United States across the board. Uh, I, I think that's true. At the same time, I know that uh, the Japanese uh, government and the Japanese public have been somewhat uh, unsettled and discomfited by what they see as a, a retreat from engagement, a retreat from multilateralism, a retreat from many of the institutions that the United States has built, uh, and even some perhaps off-the-cuff statements about withdrawing troops from Asia or uh, loving Kim Jong-un uh, that they find somewhat alarming. And so I, I don't rule out the possibility that there's a, a, a tiny bit of insurance policy in a Japanese strategy to try to put their bilateral relationship with China on a, on a more uh, normal footing. We are out of time. Let me turn to Tom, uh, if I may, for the final word. Uh, well, well, thank you, Dan. I really just want to say two things. First of all, uh, listening to this great conversation has put two sort of odd and uh, uh, kind of unrelated thoughts in my head about coming events here, but bear with me. First of all, if you're stressed by all the politics, whatever your persuasion, I'm reminded that it's Wednesday, which uh, at the Asia Society means at 1230 you can come into this building in our auditorium and have free guided meditation sessions. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, you can stay here, you can go to the galleries, you can have your meditation, you can have your lunch, what have you. Uh, the other thing is Ambassador Kenny made so many uh, interesting prognostications and, and predictions in her opening remarks and throughout the conversation uh, that it would be remiss of me not to, uh, and, and you instructed us to put so many things on the calendar. So if I may ask you to put one other thing on the calendar. On the 11th of December, uh, in the evening, 6.30, we will have our annual uh, what we call the experts forecast, this one for Asia 2019. We've been doing this for the past several years. And um, on the stage that night, we will have John Park from the Kennedy School, great expert on Korea and other things. Uh, Vali Nasser, the dean of the uh, uh, School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. And our own Wendy Cutler, uh, Danny's colleague and mine, vice president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. So that's, and, and that's a fun one where you not only can grill them on their predictions, but make some of your own, and uh, that's the 11th of December. But mostly, I just want to say thank you to Danny Russell and especially to Ambassador Chrissy Kenny. We really appreciated having you. Thank you. Thank you.